Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us. I'm Melinda Neville. I'm in the Indigenous Science Department at Leech Lake Tribal College. And I'm really excited about this partnership that our students in our um, community have been able to partake in, which is an equitable partnership for knowledge exchange. And so this is gonna be a bit of a panel discussion among the partners that are involved in this project. And so to start us off, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kurt Kipsmuller from the University of Minnesota. Welcome and thank you. I'm gonna hope I can move my thing without cutting myself off here, but we'll soon find out. So thanks for coming everybody and thanks for hosting this. Uh, the last time I did a lunch and learn was a little different and it was as we were just starting this project and I think it was September of 2019 and we had a wonderful lunch. So in, in celebration of that, I have my banana for my lunch so I can make it at least feel like it's a little bit of a lunch and learn. So I wanna start just by, by acknowledging um, all of the partners that have been involved in this, this project over the course of the last couple of years. It was slated to be a one-year project, um, but as you well know, some things kind of got in the way, and so we stretched it out for a couple of years, which I think was a, a huge benefit to all of us in terms of our growth as partners. Um, so uh, I've listed the partners here, the people that have been involved, but I, I want to make sure that, that you know that, and you'll notice from the pictures that there were a lot of people involved in this project over the course of the last two years, including many students from both the University of Minnesota um, and Leech Lake Tribal College, um, other members from the DRM that came out with us um, from the community itself. So this is a, a much bigger project. We're, I, I'm here with my partners just to kind of give you an overview of, of what we did and, and where we're going. And, and I think some of the unique ways that we've maybe grown as a group. Um, I wanna also invite my partners to, if I, misspeak or if I miss something to just uh, jump in and, and add on as you see fit. As you all know by now, um, I'm used to that. So before I begin, I want to make a, a pretty quick acknowledgement that I, I think is a, a pretty obvious one, but I think it's important to do um, just to, to acknowledge the respect that we have for the landscapes that we work on. And, and this partnership was really developed as a, as a means to to develop um, a language of respectful knowledge exchange. Um, that is, how do we communicate with one another surrounding natural resources issues um, that are of importance to a broader community? So what is it, how do we actually exchange information that, that some of us might hold individually, but that might benefit the larger group? Um, so all of the work that we did and that we have been doing and we hope to continue to do um, has been carried out on Leech Lake uh, Nation. And um, we wanna make sure that, that what we're producing, and I think that this is the main aim of our partnership, that the information that we're producing and the information that we're developing and sharing with one another is also a benefit to the broader community. So today I'm gonna to go through, um, or we, cause it's not just gonna be me speaking. Um, we're gonna go through a few different things. I, I'm gonna to try to provide you with a little bit of context. Um, a little later on, we'll talk specifically about some of the partnership goals that we've had and, and some, of our, some of our accomplishments, what we've been up to, I guess, for the last two years. All of this sort of centered around developing a conversation around fire history and land use and land tending. Um, we started off by focusing on a particular landscape, but we've been thinking a little bit more broadly over time. So I'll talk a little bit about the fire history development uh, that was done specifically on Star Island, but then I wanna talk, or I'll have others talk uh, about some of, the, some of the ways that we're thinking about this partnership moving forward. So I, I've been trying to summarize this, and I actually looked back at my, my, uh, my lunch and learn from 2019 to see how did we start off thinking about this project. And when we came together as a, as a partnership group, um, originally it was, it was Lane Johnson, myself, uh, Sean Donham, and Melinda, and Amy Burnett, um, all from different places, none of whom had actually worked together. I guess I had worked with Lane, but none of us had worked together on anything. And so there was a little bit of uncertainty, I think, in how we would make this exchange work. And I think the way I like to summarize um, maybe our, our approach is that we're trying to understand the natural world from a variety of different perspectives. But in order to do that, really the best way to do that is to try to listen and to, and to hear all of the voices that might be speaking. And that involves different stakeholder groups. Um, it involves you know, thinking about Western science, traditional ecological knowledge, and thinking about what, what the landscape itself might be able to tell us um, about what is going on within a particular area. 
um, over time, the partnership group has grown um, a bit. You know, we've uh, additional people from Leech Lake Tribal College have become involved, um, Dan DeVoe and Brett Silvis and some others. And we've been trying to incorporate those perspectives and those voices as we've gone. And I think it's been a, a pretty, um, it's been a very formative uh, a, a group and a, a, a nice way of exchanging information that, that we might not otherwise have had had we worked in our own little siloed area, uh, speaking for me specifically, or if we hadn't been able to get out and interact with people that we might not otherwise have, have found a way to, I guess, in, in, in other, other circumstances. So Cass Lake, um, which many of you know, I'm sure many of you probably have the pleasure of being there a lot more often than I do. Um, this is actually take a picture taken on Star Island. Um, and like I said, this is my, I think that was my second visit to the area. So most of our work is taking place on Star Island uh, in Cass Lake or Windaguminus Gamisquakagog, uh, the place of the red cedar. And, and I wanna make sure that, that we, we try where we can to, to use the, the, traditional, um, the traditional names for these places. Um, so respectfully, I, I put these, these, these names up there to, to make sure that we know that. And Star Island has a very long history. Um, and uh, it figures prominently in, in the colonization of, of Northern Minnesota because it's one of the places where Henry Schoolcraft stopped on his way to find the headwaters of the Mississippi River. And there were other, other visits to the area by, by colonists as well. And one of the things that was noted was that the use of the island by, by the Ojibwe early in, in the, the history of, of the formation of the state of Minnesota. And I think that that's something that, that we need to acknowledge that this is a landscape that, that was very, very important long before white settlers moved to the area. So I wanna, I wanna introduce another one of the partners, uh, Lane Johnson from Cloquet Forestry Center in the University of Minnesota. And, and Lane's gonna spend a little bit of time walking through you know, what the forest maybe looked like in the past versus what it might look like today and maybe why that's the case. So uh, go ahead, Lane. Thanks, Kurt. Hey, everyone, it's good to be here. Uh, as Kurt said, I uh, work uh, in, at the Cloquet Forestry Center. I'm a research forester here, part of the University of Minnesota. Uh, we're located on the Fond du Lac Reservation uh, and I live in Duluth, uh, 1854 treaty area. So I've been really finding uh, the conversations part of this group to be super informative and, and valuable for me. And it's great to be here sharing some of our insights uh, with a larger audience. Um, so as Kurt said, the history of, of Star Island uh, is goes back into deep history um, because people have been visiting this place for so long. It's, um, we have a lot of different historical records that uh, explain the forest conditions of the island, um, particularly uh, around the turn of the century and onward. And so we can look at historical photos as uh, one, um, uh, I guess, line of evidence to understand how this landscape, a part of the, the National Forest and the Leech Lake Reservation have have changed over time. So uh, these national forest photographs that are available online to anyone to access um, show some of the historical forest conditions on the island. You can see the center image in 1970, 1917, uh, a red pine uh, stand that has a really open fire maintained understory that's almost park-like, not a lot of brush um, present. You can walk through there or you could throw a Frisbee or a football through uh, to a friend. Um, and the forest conditions that are, that are demonstrated in these historical photographs um, really indicative of what uh, pine systems across Northern Minnesota and, and the Great Lakes region um, likely looked, looked like um, in the past uh, when they were prior to the fire suppression era and prior to colonization. Um, that they have took on more of a, a woodland characteristic with, um, you know, tree coverage, uh, but open understories that um, had diverse ground flora um, and uh, were easy to move through and to see uh, wildlife and, and uh, game for hunting. Um, so there's a lot of um, value to this specific uh, forest condition from a, a cultural standpoint. And um, as fires were suppressed with the establishment of the Chippewa National Forest, you can see the photos on either side of this uh, center photo, 1938, um, that the forest conditions uh, began to change in the absence of fire 
you have uh, different species coming up um, to, to take advantage of um, the growing space within these sites. So Kurt, you can go to the, the next slide. So on Im the image at, on the left here, it shows uh, historical conditions again, uh, these uh, big charismatic uh, uh, red pine uh, that are sort of um, a bit more open or not densely spaced. And uh, the understory is more open and there's fairly good visibility. And today we have uh, red pine still present in the overstory uh, of Star Island, but we have an understory that's much more dense. Um, it's filled with brush and uh, hazel uh, is everywhere. And in other areas, um, we have some dense white pine regeneration. Um, and so it's not necessarily that this forest condition is is good or bad, but it's it's different from the historical character of these sites. Um, and uh, I was talking with a Fond du Lac elder th earlier this morning, and he was saying that this is a phenomenon that's uh, really occurring across northern Minnesota and on the Fond du Lac reservation here. Um, you know, you can't walk 10 feet into the woods without getting tangled up in brush or a uh, windfall. And so um, there are, I guess, both ecological and, and cultural sort of repercussions to um, this type of forest change in the absence of fire. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So this is where I handed off to, to Sean and Marcy. Uh, uh, I guess I'll let both of you introduce yourselves, but um, both of both Sean and Marcy are a cultural resource specialist with the Chippewa National Forest and, and better equipped to cover this section. Sean, you're muted. The host should be able to unmute your Sean. Hey, thanks. If I was unable to unmute myself, and I wish I think a lot of people have that desire that they could mute me uh, whenever they wanted to. But I'd also, you know, want to make sure that uh, Amy Burnett and Marcy Gochi get a chance to talk about some of this as well. Um, you know, as Lane was mentioning, Star Island has got a long human history, you know, going back, uh, you know, at least 5,000 years. Um, quite a bit of the archaeological survey that's been done on the island has been done by the Leech Lake Heritage Sites Program. And uh, back around 1912, 19, 19, 2012 and 2013, we, uh, we were partnering with Leech Lake to do some surveys out there. And by we, I mean the Chippewa National Forest. And they recorded um, about 45 new sites. So we have about 50 sites that we know about out on the island, you know, which is, which is quite nice. There's a site on the uh, northwest end of the island, which uh, has produced material uh, in, a, in a sequence going back to about 5,000 years ago up to the present in, uh, or to the, to the recent present. And the artifacts shown in these, these photos here um, are from that, that particular site. So down at the bottom, you have older end scrapers, which were used uh, for a variety of things. They were kind of like the, uh, the, the knife or jackknife of the, all the times through pre-contact. And they were used to process hides, uh, to, to cut things, to, to scrape things and so forth. And then up to the more recent materials, such as the two different examples of pottery on the right and the left of the screen. And then in the, in the center, we have uh, some projectile points, um, often popularly called arrowheads, which are the most recent in here with uh, the one, the kind of the whitish one in the top row, uh, 
mostly coming from the time period between about AD 1200 and about AD 1750. So right up to um, the time that the fur traders were showing up that, uh, that those tools were being used. So we've got a long-term uh, history of this. Marcy or uh, Amy, would you like to add anything to that? I'm good, Sean. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are you, and you're on, aren't you, Amy? I am. Okay. Okay, Kurt, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So what uh, most people, when they think about archaeology, think about it uh, from the perspective of artifacts being excavated from the ground. And uh, this project is, is showing us that uh, we can learn a lot about uh, land use above the ground and working with the trees here to, uh, to tell us and, and inform us as to what, what was going on. So in effect, these trees are all, are all artifacts. Um, so you see the tree with the, the red ribbon on it that says peeled red pine. So this is a tree uh, from the Boundary Waters, which was used to uh, um, produce pitch um, and resin that would be used for canoe making and canoe repairing on a portage trail um, along the, what's now the Canadian US border. And then the tree to the left is uh, a fire scarred red pine, um, which we'll be talking about the cultural role of fire um, on, these, on these landscapes. And these marks on the trees indicate to us that there has been multiple instances of fire on the landscape and most of those uh, associated with human use. Marcy or uh, Amy, would you like to add anything to this? I'm good. Okay. I, I like these examples that show cultural use recorded in trees. Oftentimes we'll see <laughs> here at Leech Lake where people will mistakenly take other sorts of naturally occurring tree formations, like where one tree will fall on another tree and then it'll start to grow up. Uh, and they'll mistakenly believe that that was culturally modified, but clearly you can see that um, there's a big difference between actually culturally modified trees and something that's naturally occurring. Kurt, you can move on to the next slide. And I think you're on, Kurt. You'll have to bear with me as I, as I move everything around from one screen to the next. So I think one of the things that, that I think that we all find to be really, really important and fascinating is, is that the trees actually have a story to tell. So whether it's a culturally modified tree or whether it's a fire scarred tree, the trees are actually recording information about cultural use of that landscape over time. And, and that's a, a really, really helpful um, aid to help us interpret the way things may have changed over time. So I'm not sure where the, the, the phrase, um, actually came from Sean, this is something that I keep borrowing from Sean, but it, it, it's the wisdom of the trees. And I think that one of the real beauties of, of the way that this partnership has evolved is, is that we've been able to, to use the wisdom of the trees to help us inform us about how the environment's changed over time, but more importantly, how in particular Star Island, but other places on the Chippewa National Forest, how human activities have tended to this landscape over time. And I, I think that, that relying a little bit on the wisdom of the trees to help tell that story has been a, a, a real important part of this process. So one of the things that um, I wanna point out is that we've been going around the landscape and we've been using uh, relict or remnant red pine stumps that are found still in the forest. I'm still doing their job in the forest. You know, they, they may have been harvested or cut down, but they still have contained within their annual range a story about how landscapes change. So on the left uh, is a remnant red pine um, stump. And you can see there's a, a saw wedge on the ground and a, an ax handle 
or a, a hatchet handle. So you can get a sense of how big, big these are. They're nondescript. They are hard to find unless you know exactly what you're looking for. But when you cut them open uh, within the annual rings of the trees, we're preserving a record of the passing fire. So on the, on the right is a picture of that same stump that's had a partial uh, section removed from it. And each one of those little triangles represents a fire event that passed along the base of that tree. Um, that particular tree has about 130 rings in it. And I think it's got, at the point that it's being shown, I think it's got about eight fires. I think there's probably 11 on it. So you're talking about a lot of fires over, over a relatively short period of time. So when we think about how we can put the, this information together over a landscape, it helps us to put together a story of how people have interacted with fire, using fire as a tool uh, to tend to that landscape and how that might have modified that landscape over time. But these trees are still there. Like we'll take a, a, we'll collect a partial section from them, but the tree remains and it's still serving an important ecological function and it's still serving a, an important cultural function as well in, in many ways. So when we go around the landscape, and so this is a, 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 what we call a fire chart. Um, it's a fire chart of, of the data that we collected from Star Island, and it represents information collected from about 39 trees. So the horizontal lines that are depicted represent the lifespan of any individual stump or remnant piece that we collected. Um, so you can see that the, the, the ages of these trees, the time span in which they live, range from a, the late 1600s, I think the 1670s, out almost to the present. Um, so those horizontal lines represent the lifespan of a particular tree, or you might think about it as the, the period in time in which the tree is collecting the story of fire. The red triangles represent an event or a fire event that occurred within the annual ring of the trees that we've captured it and we were able to actually date it. So along the top, we list off some of those, some of the years, some of the important years of the fire. Now, 10 years ago, I probably would have looked at this without really thinking about it um, and looked at it and I would have said, wow, there's an awful lot of fire occurring on Star Island between about 1790 and 1817. There's a lot of fires, they're at very short intervals. It must have been super, super dry. There must have been a ton of drought. The, the drought must have been terrible then. When you put this within the framework of understanding the cultural history of that island, maybe there's a, a bit of a different interpretation. Maybe these, these repeated short interval fires represent the, the tending of the landscape for any number of, of reasons. Now, we oftentimes think about the use of fire as a, as a tool for management um, to improve berry crops and improve berry production or raspberry production. But one of the things that I think has become an important part of our partnership and our discussions is that that's maybe an oversimplified uh, interpretation of why fire might have been used on the landscape. And I'm looking at you, Daniel DeVoe, um, for having those discussions and others too. But like there, there are good reasons to use fire beyond simply enhancing resources. Maybe clearing the forest so you can walk through it a little bit more easily. Maybe trying to remove some of that brush that we see that's building up now to keep uh, insect pests down. So there's lots of different reasons for it. But the bottom line is, is that it, it carefully shows that fire was an important part of this landscape for a very, very long time. Um, and then it stopped. And it stopped in the early 1900s, right around the time um, that it became a forest reserve, and right around the same time that the landscape um, stop being used by, by, uh, by the Ojibwe. And I think that, or I shouldn't say stop being used, but it was not used as heavily and fires were, were actually, um, were not just suppressed, but ignitions were suppressed as well. So we suppressed an entire culture of ignitions and land tending when we, when we actually did that. Um, but it, the history of fire on this landscape and, the, and Marcy and, and Amy and Sean can better attest to this, it coincides with the use of that landscape um, in an Ojibwe village that was, that was established on the island, seasonally established on the island on O'Neill's Point. So I wanna just talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done as part of our partnership activities. So a big part of this was about knowledge exchange. Um, the development of the fire history became sort of a vehicle for us to help us have a conversation. We, we needed something to talk about, which is ironic because now when, when we get together as partners, we seem to have no shortage of things to talk about, um, but we, we needed a, a topic to help 
guide our discussions. And so we, we developed this fire history, which I just showed you. But, but the fire history, while when we first started, people like me that are fire historians, I thought this was the important part. This is the key piece of what we're doing. Um, I think the knowledge exchange activities uh, were more important, or not more important, but they, they led to some broader discussions. So we had many field uh, conversations and demonstrations, uh, public outreach um, and discussions. We were trying to, to get into the community as much as we could. Granted, we got kind of stuck because we had difficult times getting together. We still tried to find ways to get out into the field. So we did a number of different things. And, and I'm gonna turn it over to, to Melinda and she's gonna talk a little bit about some of, the, some of the, the activities that we did. So go ahead, Melinda. Remember, I have control of the slides. Well, it's good that you maintain control. So this two-way knowledge exchange has been an incredible asset um, for our students, for our community, and for our partners in this project. Um, we were able to bring three cohorts of students out over the course between 2019 and 2021, in part because of the pandemic, meaning that our grant year was extended. We were able to continue this work which has just added, you know, another level of um, that knowledge exchange. And I was really excited when Daniel DeVoe joined our team in summer of 2020. And he's pictured here with two of our summer interns out on Star Island participating in that research, working not only with faculty from University of Minnesota, but also students and grad students. And so to have that kind of coalition around something that is so localized and culturally important has been a, been a great boon to our knowledge base. Um, I'd like to, talk to um, turn it over to Dan briefly to talk a little bit about some of the cultural exchange in teachings and storytelling that we were able to do. Dan? Um, morning, everybody. Um, it's Dan. I would say that most of the things happened organically. They were just uh, questions that have either came from staff, students, or interns. Um, I was, this is the first time I ever went to this island. Um, my grandmother told me not to even go there, so especially in the wintertime. So that was part of the understanding that we had, that we understood some of the things. And then there's more things that mainly just happened organically. I grew up um, with my grandmother that was a fluent first speaking Ojibwe woman. Um, luckily I could, I just happened to explain a lot of the things that, that were there. I was taught a lot of them things and I understood them. So, mm -hmm. but I felt very lucky to have this cultural exchange and understanding and being heard. That's the biggest uh, thing I get away from this is being treated as an equal. So, yeah. Next slide, please. And so we were able to bring the students along to help us build work for that learning experience. And Star Island is a little hard to get to. So there are other places that we were able to take field trips like to Norway Beach, to Pine Point and other areas. And having, you know, I'm a geochemist by training. So I understand fire from a very different perspective than a dendrochronologist or a cultural anthropologist. And to have all that expertise plus community knowledge and oral history in one place, it became very special. Next slide, please. We even shared some um, opportunities to record video lectures where we can actually demonstrate these techniques that we're using in the field and the stories behind them to future students through a video series. So we're looking forward to um, Dan's work on polishing up the educational videos that we did while on site. Next slide, please. And with this, this is pretty exciting um, with the technology and tools that we're using now, particularly in the pandemic where we've had to move a lot of things digitally um, Kurt and Lane introduced the Dendro Elevator program to us where we can actually 
look at cores. These are tree rings here and a core that was taken out of a tree and be able to do some measurements, being able to actually visualize and play with the science in a classroom. Or, you know, leech like we may have smaller classes, we may not have extra lab space for new equipment, but this makes this type of study accessible to all of our students. With that, I'll turn it back over to Kurt. Or Dan. <laughs> I think one of the valuable things we heard was how to share in ceremony, how to be respectful on the landscape. And Dan, if you're ready, I'll let you cover that. Um, well, I'm mainly like I taught the, a lot of the students on how to put out tobacco. That was a normal part of my growing up, giving respect to, to the forest. And if you're, you're in my mind, we were actually harvesting things from the trees, so it made sense to leave um, or leave a thanks, I guess, or a, they show that we're grateful for them, for the trees, I guess. So that was a big part of what we were doing. That picture was kind of neat. I found that eagle feather, and they, I usually find them all the time, but when I go in the woods, but everybody thought it was pretty important, so. Explain some of the things with the, the feather too. So what I've learned. So it's a neat opportunity. I just want to say one thing. Dan, Dan mentioned that that he he taught um, that he that he explained a lot of the ceremonial sides of things and uh, to the students. But it, it wasn't. You, you should remember, Dan, that it's not just the students that you were teaching while you're out there too. Because I think that a lot of us. I learned quite a bit from from you and others out there while we were, while we were doing the work. So, um, and that includes not just not just you know undergrads and graduate students from the University of Minnesota, but I, there was a, a pretty broad exchange, and including a lot of folks from the Forest Service. I think one day when we were out um, at a different lake, uh, I think we had three or four different visitors that that came out and just walked out and spent an hour with us, or two hours, or three hours, just learning about what we were doing and. Some may have come to, to learn about how we collected fire history information, but I think they left with something more than that. And I think that that was something that, that was that we maybe don't always appreciate as much as we maybe should. So um, I want to just mention quickly that um, that we have a, a website that um, or we have a story map that goes along with the work that we've been doing. And um, so it's available, and I think that, that these slides will probably be shared. I think Melinda, I'm not sure if that's correct or not, um, but we can make the, the link to the, to the story map available, available too. So I'm going to turn it over to Sean for a second and, and let Sean um, talk a little bit about the, uh, um, maybe some of the future, where we're thinking about, uh, where we're going with this. I don't know if I have to unmute Sean or if, if Sean can unmute him, if he has the power to unmute himself now. I have the power now to un unmute myself. It's pretty exciting. So uh, as Kurt said, you know, we've got a variety of future partnership plans that we're working on. Um, Melinda has talked a little bit about the uh, development of the digital learning tools um, so that we have distance learning opportunities so that students at Leech Lake Tribal College can, um, you know, see see things that are being done at the University of Minnesota and uh, and use that material in the class classrooms. And I think there's even talk, um, you know, that Kurt and Melinda have been talking about uh, an opportunity where um, students from University of Minnesota and Leech Lake Tribal College would be in the same class with one another and, uh, you know, using things like Zoom and digital technology to, to make that happen. The story map that Kurt just mentioned will be uh, continuing to update that as we learn more and as we move forward with the project. So it's kind of a living document. And it's kind of an interesting way to, uh, to present this material, um, different than a website, um, in that it kind of goes through a, a process or a story more or a map, you know, as this name story map uh, um, suggests there. We're also working on coming up with a way to get some interpretive signs up on uh, both on Star Island as well as uh, 
you know, in some of the uh, Forest Service Visitor Center locations so that uh, people visiting the area and visiting the island can get a better understanding of what the cultural history is of that island and how the landscape was shaped you know, by the Ojibwe people. And we're going to incorporate as much uh, Ojibwe language in, Ojibwe Moan, right, you know, into, the, into those signs to do that. Another exciting thing, and Kurt you know, has talked a little bit about that, and so has Melinda, you know, in their, when they've talked, is we're looking at some additional sites, um, both on the Leech Lake Reservation and the Chippewa National Forest. And so we've, um, we've got Star Island, we've done a little bit of looking at uh, Norway Beach, um, but we've also been looking on Lake 13, and uh, that's been a really exciting area. We've got a lot of uh, cultural information coming in there and whatnot. And then we've also done some work on Pine Point and that, that landscape I think is going to be really great because of all the information that uh, seems to be there. You know, there's, and Kurt, you can correct me, but we have trees out there that have 12 to 15 fire scars, you know, over a 100, 150 year period showing that that landscape is uh, very active. And what's beautiful, you know, when you're out there at Pine Point, I don't know how many of you have been out there and I noticed this before that there are some huge pine trees out there, red pine, um, as big as the stuff at the Lost 40. Um, and they're kind of spaced out, you know, throughout the landscape and smaller red pines and other trees are around there. And I really think what we're gonna find is that those spaced out really large trees is what that, that landscape looked like you know, 100, 150 years ago uh, before everything was able to grow after the suppression of fire after the creation of the National Forest. So that's really cool. And going back to Lake 13 and to uh, Norway Beach, those were parts of portages, uh, going from Cass Lake down to Leech Lake, you know, that area. And so I think we're gonna see a lot of evidence and maybe we'll even find some of those large scarred trees, or um, excuse me, culturally modified trees, which were used to uh, patch and to make canoes there too, because of the portages through there. But this is really an exciting, Exciting time. Um, Mercy and, and Amy, is there anything you'd like to add you know, to what I was just saying here? No, I'm good, Sean, thank you. Okay. Maybe I would just add that we might be moving into the cut foot zoo area. Right, yeah, that's some plans we do have too is over by cut foot. Okay, I guess you can go to the next slide, Kurt. So I'll just, um, we're, we're about to wrap up here, but I, I wanna emphasize that, that I think that a lot of us went into this uh, partnership with different ideas in mind as to what the partnership meant and what, what the work would meant. And I, and I think that we all sort of came away um, having learned some unexpected things. I know that, that when the pandemic hit, um, it was pretty devastating because we'd only have been able to have, you know, a handful of field meetings and a handful of in-person meetings. And we really didn't know what, what was going to happen. And I think one of the things that, that was unexpected for me anyway, and, I, and I'm hoping that, that some of my partners will chime in on this, but one of the things that I think was un unexpected is just how well we were able to, to continue our work despite the, the pandemic. And I also know that for me, I learned that that maybe collecting 50 fire scars in a day or 20 fire scars in a day wasn't the goal. Uh, maybe the goal is to just be able to go out and have conversations with people and learn a little bit about each other, but also learn a little bit about forest and our impressions of the forest and, and how we feel about it. And I think that that was a really, really important part. But I think all of us, the partners involved came away with maybe a different understanding of um, each other and a different understanding of, of how we, we think about natural resources. And it, what it's done is it's, it's made us, sort of invigorated us, I guess, to, to kind of think about creative ways to continue this, this process, whether it's interactions between the University of Minnesota and, and Leech Lake Tribal College in terms of teaching, or it's, it's going out into the forest with, with um, knowledge keepers to discuss uh, how fire might have been used. There's lots of different ways we can kind of think about this going forward. But um, there were many things that were, were sort of unexpected. So um, I'm going to just uh, just simply say uh, miigwech and, and thanks for your time and, and thanks for the support of this project because a lot of different people were involved. It, it 
we started with four partners and we have a few more than that now. Um, the project itself was actually supported by the Minnesota Historical Society, their, their partnership project, partnership program. Um, and so I wanna just end by saying, you know, if any of the partners wanna add anything, uh, feel free to do so, but hopefully we have a little bit of time and we can answer some questions because I know we didn't get into the nitty gritty of the details of some of the actual um, fire history that people might be interested in, but there were, there were a lot of other things that I think were important as well. So Miigwech, so thank you very much for, for hosting us all um, and joining us today. Thank you, Kurt, Lane, Marcy, Sean, Amy, and Dan. Um, this has been a wonderful partnership. I can't wait for it to continue. And I've now uh, figured out the button to let people unmute themselves, but also feel free to ask more questions in the chat. Do you wanna stop screen sharing, Kurt? How's that, better? Yeah. So one of the questions um, that came in is, I think Sean, it was you that mentioned the, the 5,000 years on Star Island, question, question, question mark. Um, how do we really know it's 5,000 years old? I'm pretty sure I fixed that button, Sean. <laughs> it was, I think we're back now. So yeah. <laughs> when I first tried, it wouldn't let me. So what, what they did, so there's a combination of things that, that were used um, to do that. So first there's the, you know, what we call diagnostic artifacts, um, artifacts that we have association with a particular time period. And so some of those uh, the scrapers that, that we showed were indicative of that, that period from about 4,000 to 5,000 years ago. We also, in this case, have uh, dating from thermoluminescence. Um, so which is a kind of a tricky thing, but you're able to look at the, uh, the rock and the sand and uh, when that rock and sand were last exposed to sunlight. And then that gets sent off to a lab. And I think in this case, it went to a lab in England. And um, and they were able to use their uh, techniques to determine that that's the last time that those materials were, uh, were exposed to sunlight or to heat. You can also do that for a campfire or something like that with heat. So, uh, so those two different sources are the main ways that we know that we have things going back 5,000 years. I want to just chime in really quickly and just note that because um, I saw that there was a question about field work or going out on field trips. Uh, we love having people on field trips. And uh, I think I don't I needed to I need to go through and count how many students actually were out with us over time. I know I did it at one point. I think we were something like 14 different students out with us at different times on different trips. And some of those students were multiple, multiple, uh, multiple tree cores, I guess. Um, so yeah, there's lots of opportunity to that, for that. And, and I'll just acknowledge also that um, several of my graduate students have volunteered a lot of effort and time on this. Um, I think some of them are on this call. I know I see, I only can see part of my screen, but I, I know um, both Evan Montpellier, Sophie Pitney and, and Dan Brum, um, as well as uh, Wally Statue have all been involved in to some degree on this project over time and Matt Trumper as well. And so um, it's, we sort of encourage that kind of interaction amongst students, faculty, DRM staff, forest service folks. So uh, how we coordinate that is, is a little more challenging, but um, hopefully uh, we'll be out in the field uh, again in the fall. And one of the reasons that we are thinking about Lake 13 and also Pine Point is that it, it, Star Island is surprisingly hard to get to. Um, because it's an island, and but it's not the only place that has has good fire history information. 
um, that can help demonstrate land tending. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why we were, we sort of thought about places that were close by. Lake 13 is not far away and, and Lake 13 is pretty amazing. And so Sophie Pitney is working on um, Lake 13 and on Pine Point. And so there, there will be work being done in the spring and the, in the summer. So, so yeah, um, hopefully we can make that work. And, and like Melinda mentioned, Melinda and I are talking a lot about how we can pull off, um, I don't even know what to call it, like a, a digital campus where we can connect two campuses together. And the idea is, is that we would do some field work in the spring as well. Question from the chat from Wendy Greenberg at um, Red Lake Nation College. How has lack of fire in the past 120 years changed the overstory and understory? Maybe that's a good question for Lane. Thanks. Yeah, I'm not sure why the, the mute button was cut off. I don't know why, I'm sorry. But yeah, the, the question related to, to vegetation change um, as far as the understory conditions, uh, the historical photos and then using tree ring evidence and, and other uh, lines of, of information, historical uh, accounts, documents, um, general land office survey notes, we, we can have a really strong sense that these forests have become much more, more dense. So they're more shaded uh, they be, because they receive less sun, they're more wet. Um, and so it changes the type of uh, vegetation that's coming up in the understory. So we have more uh, shade tolerant or like mesic uh, species that are that are establishing and are the future forests on these sites that were historically pine dominated. So I'm thinking of Star Island. I want to say there's more, uh, quite a bit of, of hazel and other brushy species that we don't necessarily consider trees um, per se. Um, uh, but then we've got red maple and ironwood and white pine that are coming in. So basically, over time, the forest of Star Island in the absence of fire uh, would potentially convert into more of a northern hardwood forest type rather than um, a fire dependent uh, woodland. Um, and uh, some of the early historical notes for Star Island from around 1910 also show uh, portions of the island that likely saw more mixed um, mixed to severity fire. So some, not just surface fire, a light burning, but um, more intense fire. There was a jack pine component there. And when you go out to those areas now, uh, the jack pine is almost all gone. Uh, it's it's um, not as long lived of a species as red pine. And so that forest component is breaking apart and being replaced uh, again by more um, fire intolerant species. So we're losing some of the, the fire dependent uh, forest diversity um, out there. Um, and then when it comes to ground flora, uh, we have a lot of decadent blueberry and other fire dependent um, herbaceous species that are, are present in the understory, but maybe not at their historical abundance. And they're also uh, maybe decadent and not necessarily producing um, the same amount of, of fruit as we would expect them to if they were fire maintained. So there's a whole lot of ways we could characterize forest change out there. Uh, to wrap it up, I'll just say that a, a lot of the um, plants and animal species that are of cultural value and um, benefit from, from frequent fire um, are not as well represented as they could be if fire was, was present today. So a related question in the chat, um, Elaine Fleming, faculty at Leech Lake Chapel College, comments, it looks like the fires seem to end around 1897. What does that tell us about the history there or about Ojibwe culture? So you can clearly see the influence that our people had within the island and other locations as far as use of fire. As Lane explained, you can see the change in the landscape as the successional trees come up once fire is being suppressed and the use of fire by people is also being suppressed. Another thing that stands out for me is the fact that it's a record 
of how our people were removed from the landscape, even though we're still present in this place, our influence on our surroundings is essentially ended at that point. Thank you, Amy. Another question here in the chat. Can this research about past practices inform how the Forest Service manages the forest in the future? I, I'm not sure I'm qualified to take this question since I'm not a federal um, employee. So uh, I think that the, the, the primary goal is to better understand how we can use fire to restore or restore these landscapes um, and, and maybe get back towards tending. And I think that that's where the conversations are, are, are kind of headed um, in the sense that it's, it's a helpful to, to understand how often a place burned. But, but I think the, the long-term thinking is like, all right, well, if fire was so important in the past, how do we, how do we get back to that um, for now? How do we do that? And I think that there's, there's obviously a lot of regulatory issues that are involved, but one of the cool things about <clears throat> Lake 13 um, is that it has been, fire, fire has been used there in an effort to start to restore that landscape. And Sean would know more, and I think other people on this, on the Zoom would know more, but I think it's been burned twice. Um, and so I think that it's an it's a opportunity to start to think about, all right, well, we know that this place has burned a lot um, uh, in the past. So as we work towards, towards understanding how often it was burned, maybe now we can start to restore fire, use fire as a, as a tool, much like it was used in the past to tend the landscape. Um, again, I'm gonna qualify that statement by saying, I don't know all of the ins and outs of the regulatory structure that go into to burning these landscapes, but I think that that is really, that's, what, that's the conversation that we need to have, is how do we now move forward um, with fire? Another question. Have there been any predictions about why these fires were done? Did it have to do with the underbrush and game or was it solely for cultural reasons? Amy, do you, Amy or Sean, do you wanna tackle that? There's several things that happen when you use fire. I am probably not the most qualified person to answer that, but a few of the things that do happen is that uh, populations that are pests or humans go down and then other populations that are useful for us rise such as berries and other beneficial beings. <laughs> I think that there's lots of reasons. I think Amy's exactly right that um, you can tell when a fire occurred, but you can't necessarily tell exactly why that fire's there. But I know Dan, we've talked about this with Dan DeVoe quite a bit. So maybe Dan has something that, that he would want to um, chime in on. There you go. I couldn't unmute. <laughs> um, from what I've learned in, um, from my family and different even different native people. I actually went to school to be a firefighter, but they changed my mind and went to a four year. And then, um, but I also, I have some of that, the science of firefighting, which is kind of a goofy term. If you think about it, because you're fight, well, it's, it's impossible to fight fire. You're just using it as a tool to change the landscape to better suit your, I would say your own needs or your own comforts. Um, it's, I've also read some, Ojibwe stories that talk about fire um, and I can never refer I can never find the book again I was reading it in a, a BSU library but it also was very similar to things my grandmother taught me um, about just keeping the forest clean and clear and, uh, and again it helps with blueberries it helps with uh, um hazelnuts I used to pick a lot of them when I was a kid um, we would pick those and keep them for winter storage um, uh, Again, it keeps it clear for game, uh, deer, just it makes it a lot healthier forest, a lot less wood ticks. Um, those are things I've, I've seen, so in my time. 
Oh, did that answer the question pretty much? I would say all of the above, but yeah. Well, and I think, you know, the in the question they talked about, you know, hunting and underbrush and those, uh, removing those is part of a cultural cultural reason too. So it's not, you know, it's, it's the way people want to live. And I think that one of the things that we see um, in a lot of places is people are creating landscapes that are familiar to them. And uh, so you grow up in this landscape and it becomes part of your culture. And so it's normalizing the landscape for each culture. And for the Ojibwa, you know, it appears in this case that they wanted these larger open forests. And in fact, with the discussions going on with the forest and the memorandum of understanding that the Forest Service has now with Leech Lake, there is a goal to bring more uh, mature forest to the landscape. And one of the tools that can be used to do that is, is using fire. You know, so this is something that is being discussed between there. Now, uh, there are some logistical constraints, you know, to burning all areas, um, whether it's there's private property next to it or or whatever. But the, so there are some issues there. And then in the case of Star Island, there's the logistics of getting uh, firefighters out there and the equipment out there, and uh, and so on. If something were to get out of hand, so. Uh, you know, so there's different pieces of it, but Kurt had mentioned at Lake 13, there has been, um, over the last 10, 15 years, there has been a few uh, burns out there to, uh, to try to get back to, you know, a, a pine forest, you know, that is more, more like they had been prior to the formation of the forest. And uh, also to, and I saw Laura Mosdale had asked the question about fuel loads. It also helps reduce the fuel loads. That's an area where Logistically, that was pretty easy to do, and they're doing a bunch of burning in that area between Lake 13 and down to the south of that area, um, you know, each year. So, um, so these are things that are going on, and uh, but with this goal of getting to a cultural landscape that is more uh, traditional, you know, to the Ojibwa and you know, potentially safer uh, for forest fires, you know, for the forest fire for the Forest Service, you know, as we've seen everything burn out west. This also leads into some of the other projects we are involved with at Leech Lake Travel College, including the Sunken Lake Blueberry Project, which was just burned um, this spring after a few years of doing vegetation surveys with interns and students and our partners at the Leech Lakes um, Division of Resource Management. And yeah, um, the description of that Lane gave of blueberries not producing was very true. We had uh, students go out there and plot, gosh, I think it was over a hundred plots and they found exactly two blueberries. Plenty of blueberry plants, but only two blueberries. And that memorandum of understanding, the listening sessions that have happened with the community have opened up that dialogue of how do we return fire in a beneficial way to avoid the catastrophes we've seen out West and to promote the desired vegetative conditions that have been stated by the tribe. So it's definitely a work in progress, but we think our project is a pretty good model of how to, you know, do respectful two-way knowledge exchange and how do we get those players in the same room with a, you know, good understanding of where um, we want to go in the future. So yes, Elaine, the partnership does Include uh, DRM. Um, Dr. Montgomery asks, how will we let Leech Lake Nation manage the forest in the future? I like that question. All right, well, I don't think I've missed any, but if we have, I'll have saved the chat and I'll be able to reply. Without further ado then, um, miigwech to the panel and to our audience. Um, we look forward to seeing you again in the future and feel free to email me questions that you come up with afterwards. I'll forward them on to who I think might have an answer. All right, miigwech, me you.
Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks. Bye, folks.